The Global Environmental Governance Keynote Conversation are Andrew Laveras, who is the former chair and CEO of the Dow Chemical Company, and Hala thomas Daughter, CEO of the B-Team. Welcome. My name is Hala thomas Daughter, and I'm the CEO of the B-Team and co-founder and co-chair of the Iceland chapter of WCD. And so I know many of you, and it's great to be here today. I am delighted to be joined by Andrew Liveris, perhaps best known as the former CEO and chairman of Dow Chemical. Andrew serves on the board of IBM, Lucid Motors, which is a uh, fast growing electric vehicle company and one of the world's largest companies, Saudi Aramco. While his board service is impressive, I prefer to describe Andrew as a Greek at heart, Australian born global citizen who has lived across Asia and in America and splits his life between Australia and America now. He's also a family man, a proud father of three, and he is, last but not least, a B-team leader who shares my passion for sustainable leadership. And we also have another shared passion, Andrew, for the need to rethink education so we can get the leadership that we need. Welcome, Andrew. Thank you. Thank you, Hala. A pleasure to be here with you talking to the WCD. I look forward to it. Well, let's dive right in and let's start with this moment we're in. We've gone through an unprecedented year. And yet before this year hit us, we were facing enormously complex challenges already. And you care deeply about this. So paint the big picture. What's going on with the economy, the big challenges we're facing? What are businesses and their board directors faced with in this moment we're in? Having the benefit of serving internationally in the organizations you talked about, especially Dow, uh, gave me the opportunity to talk to some incredibly talented people around the world. And when I say talented people, I also mean people in the factories, I mean people in the, um, in the boardrooms, people uh, in governments, in the White House, the Blue House. Uh, you know, the, these interactions over decades have helped me understand that the tectonic shift we're seeing in the world today, mostly characterized by the turn of the century. If you think of 2000 and then the turn that we saw, we've seen three global existential crises in 20 or so years, 9-11, the 0809 financial crisis, and now the pandemic. Um, this is more than a warning signal. This is absolutely, totally a, a tectonic change and humanity as we careen from 7 billion people to 9 billion people by 2050, I think it's more than a canary in a gold mine or coal mine analogy. It's actually danger. And, and the danger signals are flashing at us because of, in fact, humanity has taken our uh, lifestyle with digital to a complete new place. And, and we are now reverberating and gyrating and responding to a lot of things in real time. And because it's real time, the things that made us great as humanity got tossed out the door that we need to reinvent. Our institutions don't work so well anymore because we don't collaborate and get the we going. Uh, the I has taken over. We're fracturing into geopolitical ecosystems that are becoming singular. Look at the collapse of the way the EU works as a good example and the Brexits, Grexits and all that. I think the United States and what happened with the election cycles there and is still happening shows the United States are anything but united. And in fact, if you look at Asia and in fact the, the imminent danger of a growing China and the saber rattling of the Taiwan issue after Hong Kong. And if you think about this virus that's almost crippled humanity, what I see is the big picture is being painted again. And it's being painted by a generation that is saying enough, enough. And we as leaders in responsible organizations have to stand up and look at this volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. That we have to look at the new triangle of work, which is a we, business, government, and society. And the apex of that triangle is society. We need to re-remember that society small, medium, large, global, is who actually humanity is. And responding to these needs of society means we need a new blueprint. And frankly, this conversation and many like this need to move to that next level of saying, I know what it is, I know where it's going, and actually we need the who and how of how to get it fixed. 
And that's my short summary of a much longer conversation. And we can go any way where you want with it. No, that was an excellent summary. And Andrew, speaking of when I um, became the CEO of the B team uh, about three years ago, I still met people who said, why is business as usual no longer an option? But in the yeah. last two years, I met fewer and fewer. And in the last year, I would venture to say, I, I hardly meet board directors or leaders in companies who think business as usual is an option. So, but so the why is, I think we've got it now, we're awake. But the yeah. question I always get, but tell me how, how do I lead against all these crises? How do I do it? So can we get real? Can we go back to, I mean, you already serve on three boards where you're tackling these challenges. But can we also go back to when you were chair and CEO of Dow and you put climate on the agenda way ahead of many other companies, certainly in your sector. And I know your board wasn't necessarily fully aligned and you had to do some hard work. So talk a little bit about how do we align boards and leaders behind this new blueprint while we still don't have clarity on what it looks like. So being in a corporation uh, like Dow for 43 years, 15 years as CEO. The pre-CEO time, I grew up with the DNA of a hundred year enterprise. In other words, it's been on the planet since you know two world wars and depressions and it, it had resiliency because of its human engine. It could adjust to the times that were appearing in front of it, front windshield, not rear view mirror. And because of that, the DNA of the company that I grew up in and why I stayed with them actually, is this whole notion of just a second, we need to transform and adjust ourselves to a reality that's appearing. So, so we were always probing out there as a corporation, looking for those signals and the, the signals around planet and the signals around climate were starting to appear in the 90s, actually. And of course, Al Gore's famous uh, um, uh, movie and, and all the things, Inconvenient Truth, and all those things that were there. We actually started reacting in the 80s and well before I was CEO. And we were part of the inaugural formation of then President Clinton's World uh, Sustainability Council. Our CEO, Frank Popoff, was appointed to that. Now, you look at a chemical company, you say, well, what, what's a chemical company doing there? This is where the mythology of chemistry, I can get into that, but I won't. Chemistry is a science, chemistry is a noble science, and chemistry provides solutions. And so our scientists, our, our persona as a safety-oriented company said, we've got to get to the solution space. There is an issue going on. Emissions have to go to zero in the 90s. So we set our first 10-year goals in 95, which were footprint goals, minimize the footprint of our assets. In 2005, I was CEO at that point, we went to the next level, handprint goals. Stop sending products out there that could harm humanity, fix it, okay? And then 2015, when I was CEO still, we set our blueprint goals, protect the planet. The borders are not our factory. The borders are not our, our product. The borders is the planet. And because of that mindset of proactivity, we attack climate very early and we put the business case. And this is the first vestige of the word sustainability. And, and it's come a long way. And actually, I'm very proud of where sustainability is now because sustainability is no, is, is no longer just an extra thing. It's actually become a core of how you do business. You mentioned it. Many companies, many boards are, re, are now moving into this. You're seeing it in the last 12 months. But back in the OOs, uh, what we had to do was actually put the business case to our shareholders because our shareholders were not interested. Our shareholders never asked about sustainability. In fact, when I introduced the value protecting our planet, they, they attacked me and our board attacked me. And actually I said, just a second, you guys are, don't understand. Our license to operate is being challenged and we have to put a business case forward. So we did. Energy efficiency, we spent a billion dollars and got a $6 billion return. Huh. You mean we can make money out of this? I know it sounds vulgar in present day, but absolutely got the attention that actually there's a business case. If you don't waste something, you actually can actually convert it into something that actually makes a return. When you got the financial return aspect of the conversation to the board table, to the shareholders at that time, they started to say, oh, energy efficiency. Oh, zero emissions. Oh, you can actually make a value proposition out of this. And that for me was a big aha moment that started to proliferate. I changed the board. 
I brought on board members who were thinking forward and were different to the norm. Paul Pullman was one of my early recruits, so proud that he decided to join our board and, and become a, a game changer, which of course he still is and has included, including chairing the B team. Jackie Barton, Professor Emeritus at Caltech, one of the most brilliant scientific minds on the planet on our board. A scientist working with business people to give answers in these sorts of spaces. These sorts of changes, including a collaboration with the Nature Conservancy to come out with a system to value nature, put a price on nature, stop abusing nature. That was a big change. Appointment of an Environmental Advisory Council consisting of our hitherto critics, the activists like World Wildlife Fund, all the, the environmental activist funds, environmental defense funds, they became on an advisory board to our board, uh, which again was like letting literally the fox into the hen house more or less, listening carefully to what they had to say. These sorts of connectivities to the board changed the board. And it frankly gave me the air cover I needed to change the company, which of course is still a work in progress. You're never done with this topic. But I am so pleased to see, and I'm sure we'll get into it, and I'm being long-winded here, but the Dow time and my time basically converted me. I transformed myself. I, I mean, I always was conscious of the world around us. Whether it was my children, now my grandchildren, I started really thinking, this is absolutely manic. When did we put this form of capitalism in place that allowed, in essence, to abuse the planet? For what? For what? The better house? The house in Florida? The boat? I mean, what, 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 what are these gains that actually were going to a few? This schism that was starting to occur in capitalism, I noticed, so I gave a speech in 07, 08, President Clinton introduced me at some award I was getting, where I said, raise my taxes. I'm earning way too much money. There is just no way I deserve all this money. Raise my taxes. Now, I want to know how those taxes get spent, but I want them spent on making the planet livable for the next generation. And I think these sort of aha moments is what's going on this very minute. But Dow was seminal to the way it changed me. Andrew, I love what you shared just here, because I've always thought you can't change the world unless you change your inner world. And I think you say, for you, it, it sort of happened simultaneously. And I think this last year has been so transformative to us as human beings that if we're not asking ourselves who we're going to be right now, when will we ask that uh, fundamental question? And also about the system. But I want to really dig into that a little more, because you and I have friends who we work with, and we've seen recently some examples where the board was not behind a transformative leader, in the case of Emmanuel Faber, CEO of Danone. We've seen both the courts and Wall Street, perhaps on the opposite end, um, put the finger down on, um, on, on, on companies that are emitting uh, or are high emitters. So oil and gas has felt it lately. How do you lead as a brave leader in a broken system? And what is the work ahead to fix the system and align us incentives in line with the work we all now know as human beings we need to do? There's, there's, a, there's a big piece of that question that I think about every day, every interaction I have. Uh, and this one is obviously a terrific one because it's enlightened people listening to these topics. And then when you think about a Greta Thunberg or you think about the, the young generation out there that is absolutely totally saying, you know, you guys need to fix this or we will fix it. Um, it, it reminds me what must have been the case prior to a World War II or, or, or to, you know, the absolute collapse uh, of humanity uh, through various other activities like the Spanish flu of 2018. Uh, I wasn't around, but I read a lot about this because I think Mark Twain said it well, uh, history doesn't repeat, it just rhymes. A and we have a rhythm right now that suggests that absolutely, totally, it's catastrophic in front of us. That 2050 net zero is not good enough. 2030 is a much more important milestone. 
that these connections and connectivities that I talked about earlier, geopolitical and, and going tribal as humanity, the breaking up means we've got to rebuild purpose-based activities and redefine capitalism to inclusive capitalism. And, and I think the courage of an Emmanuel um, and not getting the air cover of his board, uh, look, I, I'm convinced I could have been fired two or three times at least during this period of time. What, what it meant was a lot, a lot of communication, which in my time wasn't seen to be part of the CEO job almost. You know, wh why are you out there with governments all the time? Why, why did you write a book, which I did? Uh, why did you, in fact, you know, why did you spend so much time on podiums? Uh, you should be running the business. You should be making dollars for us every quarter, okay? And, and the fact that you're not, okay, means you're not a good CEO. This is wrong, and this is where boards need to change. Inclusive capitalism needs metrics, of course, of the ESG kind, but it also needs transparency of tracking those metrics, and it needs what we just saw at Exxon, accountability from the board that absolutely totally says that it's the long-term cost of ownership I'm going to measure you by. It's actually your right to operate in society going forward I'm going to measure you by. And zero emissions is doable. If you're an oil and gas company, it's doable. You can absolutely totally change your business model. You may not want to because it makes money for you this very moment, but that money is false money. It's false profits. So that means a connectivity to actually totally get the regulatory side of this thing fixed because Unfortunately, the triangle that is capitalism, especially in Western democracies, so we have government sitting in, in the case of the US, Washington, we have finance sitting in mainly in New York, and we have population sitting everywhere, which is in some way, shape or form, either understands it, but is seen as rich elite, like on the West Coast of the US possibly, and then the oppressed middle class that's disappearing because they don't have access to universal healthcare and education, we are fracturing everyone with our regulatory environments. We need to put the case for change, that inclusiveness means a different type of capitalism with different types of accountabilities and different regulations, that it's not good enough to make money in the short term. And the rich getting richer has to be done with, and that paying more taxes to be spent wisely to protect the future is part of the change in regulatory and reform that needs to happen. So I'm a big believer that capitalism needs reformation. Now, is there the best model out there? Absolutely not. You know of living in Europe. I mean, you know, you understand that there are environments which actually take entrepreneurism and, and throw it out the door and everyone's the same. Australia is a bit egalitarian that way. We're not trying to make everyone the same. We're trying to give everyone the same opportunity. And that's a very different mindset that has to come in regulatory reform and actually has to start with how we hold companies and boards to account. And I think that is what I see as the reform need in inclusive capitalism and what we all have to push and reform our institutions in, in the process. We're operating with 20th century rule books. We have to throw those rule books out and put 21st century rule books in place and 21st century tools. I love that you bring that up as the B team is looking to put out its new leadership playbook in September, really uplifting why our leadership now needs to be more holistic. Like I think still a lot of people don't understand that our refugee and migrant crisis is largely a consequence of the climate crisis. And I think a lot of people don't understand that if cli you know, that climate hits women and people of color harder, the next generation harder, the global south, south harder and so on and so forth. I don't understand. I don't believe we understand the interdependence of our challenges. And so this holistic leadership that you talk about, I can see you sitting in the boardroom at Lucent Motors talking like this, but now I have to ask you, so how do you go from fast growing electric vehicle company board into the board room of the largest emitter in the world, Saudi Aramco? And how, do this co how does this coexist within you as feeling so strongly about our needing to stop uh, polluting the world, getting to net zero by 2050 or much before. Um, tell us a little bit about this. Yeah, look, um, maybe maybe all of us have to understand that embedded in one human is a mind that maybe sometimes feels schizophrenic or bipolar or, or is 
debating with itself. I mean, uh, I have endless debates. I mean, I don't think I'm certifiable crazy, but I do have endless debates about, you know, where can you actually make this uh, uh, collection of difference, you know, come together and collaborate. Uh, there's an old adage, it's not mine, which um, is, goes something like this. If, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. Um, I, I think you've got to really have a mindset that we have to be all at the same table. I gave a recent talk here in Australia and, you know, the environmental community uh, was making the same point to, that you just made. How can you be beyond the board of Aramco and on the board of Mindaroo, which is absolutely, totally getting a whole drive on metrics to change how much plastics goes into the environment versus recycling? How, how can you be, you know, from Dow? on the board of the largest plastics company, and also now move over to this place that actually helps regulate the recycling of plastics. Well, it's because what science brings you, I mentioned Jackie Barton earlier or Paul Pullman, what science brings you is an understanding that at the base of everything is facts. And because you need those facts developed to create the argument, let's get all the facts from everyone. Not, it, no one's a Neanderthal on purpose. Okay, uh, we, we, you know, we may be behaviorally that way because we're measured that way, which is the measurement topic. So I, I reconcile this by saying, I see my ability to help Aramco change or help Dow change as seminal. I, I, and that's almost my responsibility because I actually understand the business model. And so when I see the Shell announcements and the BP announcements, uh, the Chevron and, and, you know, and Total, uh, and I look over at Aramco, Aramco is making the same announcements. Now, people from a distance judge it badly because they, they, they read the headlines. They don't look at the facts. And what I would argue to everybody is, let's stop yelling at each other, okay? The yelling at each other gets us, okay, got, we got your attention, we understand. Now, put down your protest sign, walk into the room and collaborate. And if you don't feel you can create change by being inside, Okay, you always have the opportunity to leave. I see change happening because I'm on the inside. And that I think is the most powerful thing one has. Hala, I don't need to do any of this. I can literally sit on a beach in Australia if I wish. I don't think my mind would allow me to do that. But why, why, why are we doing this? Why, why are we contributing ourselves? Why are we opening ourselves up to criticisms actually? Well, because we have to. Bold, right? the B team word, bold, be bold, be yeah. courageous. I think it's our responsibility to actually help redefine this, this century. You know, I've mentioned grandchildren, I mentioned, you've mentioned children. I, I look, I, I feel it very close and personal, but I also feel it for myself. And frankly, I think the, Ara the Saudi Arabian thing is a positive development in the main, lots of things to worry about. The Dow developments, very positive. If they don't happen at the pace that we want them to happen, you do something about it. Mm. Don't just let the headlines do it. Exactly. And I think you said something about what I sometimes call the othering that is going on in society. And I was in a equitable vaccine meeting this week and I asked a representative from one of the pharma companies if they could please come up with a vaccine for otherness, because I think we might be self terminating by othering so much. And you mentioned the need for government, civil society and private sector to work together. And Andrew, I've certainly seen you hard at work with us on the B team at advocating uh, for the G7, for the G20, for the EU and others to align all of this money that we've been printing um, to recover from and during COVID. And, I'll, and we want to align it with like green and inclusive measures. And some places are doing that a little harder than others. How do you feel about, because sometimes some people say the cradle of capitalism is in America and it's in the big global companies that many of who come from America, that shareholder primacy sits in the boardroom and the general counsels of companies will tell you your only role is to maximize shareholder wealth. Not all of them, but we all hear this. So how do we, how do you see this shifting? How does it actually happen? How do we tackle the crisis of conformity that sits in the very system that served us well, created a lot of wealth, but has now left us on a burning planet with a broken social contract? How do we go well, from this 
system to this new system? Is it regulations? Is it business changing itself without any regulation? Is it both? Is it putting more women in leadership? Um, tell, tell me more. Yeah, look, um, so talking about boards of directors, which is, you know, this audience here talking about the role of women is something uh, I'm very passionate about, but I'll wrap it with the, the major question you're asking, which is the role of boards in doing this is become seminal. And I'll, I'll give it to you firstly in the description of another organization I belong to. I'm a strategic advisor to Focus Capital on the long term. And it was one of the early organizations co-founded by Larry Fink, the then CEO of uh, McKinsey, Dominic Barton, Mark Wiseman, the then CPPIB, Canadian Pension Plan Investment Board Head and, I, and myself. And we formed this and now it's a huge organization because of an observation on what was happening at boards, in particular boards. And, and think of the virtuous circle of capitalism this way. In the US, let's use the US as the proxy for the conversation, although it applies in most capitalist societies. You have people who have pensions and that money goes up and gets managed by the asset owners. And then the asset managers do allocations and mutual funds of the portfolio of that money. And then over here, they end up owning entities and enterprises in the public domain. And, and those entities are run by boards of directors and CEOs and management, and they employ people. And those people are the workers and those workers retire. And then they have pensions and it closes the circle. So the pensioner and the worker is the same group. We've, we've, the group that's that chain's broken. That's broken. Because in essence, to make money in the short term, the CEO and the management, we mentioned CEOs, 90 days returns is what the financial community is insisting that those enterprises earn to give them a value. And if you don't give them that value in the short term, you're fired. So what does the CEO do? Goes to productivity, forget research and development, forget expansion, forget growth. The best way to actually give you a return in the short term is to actually fire you, the worker. The very person whose pension is being managed is being fired, okay? Now, you can't make that up. You actually can't make that up. So, so then the metrics are wrong, to say the obvious. A 90-day short-term return metric for the hedge funds and the activist funds is wrong. And to break up the company and to get people and communities out of jobs is not what enterprises were actually developed for. They were developed to actually have sustainable growth and to put metrics in place on the word growth with the word sustainable in front of it is the challenge that we now have back to your question. So how do we actually fix that? Boards have to change. Boards have to change and understand that when shareholders of a certain type ask them just for a financial return, there has to be pushback on, I need to explain to you the metrics around long term. I won't be, this company won't be around in five years. You won't care because your money will move to some other company. But absolutely, totally, okay, the multiple stakeholders involved in this, the community, the employees, the customers, the governments that are involved in that enterprise will suffer as you win. That's bad distribution. And so that KPI, the ESG KPIs, whether it's, you know, the, the financial disclosure drive that we've got on, the transparency of metrics of the ESG kind need to be institutionalized and the boards need to absolutely totally home in on those conversations. What are they? Time spent on strategy, ownership, ownership of the company's future, which is the one I just mentioned, including skin in the game, by the way, direct interactions with shareholders, and then inclusion and diversity at the board. Mm. Because if we don't mirror the society we live in and we are creating, we will make bad decisions. And the role of women on boards then becomes seminal. The role of diverse people of all types on boards becomes seminal. I saw it as we diversified Dow's board. And as we've begun the march now to diversify, including Lucid, as you mentioned, but also Aramco, diversify our board. This difference of opinion creates an understanding of how to actually push back on the value proposition that has been in place for so long. Last, I'll say, this means that enterprise risk management systems need to come to life mm -hmm. and criteria for who stays on boards needs to come to life. Long tenure, just for the sake of the fact that you've been on the board is not good enough. Your performance as a director is what matters. 
and your performance isn't this 90-day financial return. It's all the KPIs around long-term cost of ownership. So that changes the type of board member. It changes how board members get selected and changes how they're held accountable. And I think, and then that they, in fact, respond to the metrics of the long term. And these funds are appearing, you know this, all the funds are now appearing. The insistence on this change is occurring from the asset owners and asset managers, but the board needs to step up. That is so good. And as we say on the B team, you need to change who to change how. We can't innovate our way into this future with more of the same in the boardroom. Andrew, uh, you have a unique opportunity to raise one, two, or three closing questions that all of these women who sit on boards around the world can take to their boardroom so they can join us in transforming their boards and their companies to join us in the journey towards this inclusive economy. What questions do you ask them to take in? That's our final minute. It's, it's a big ask, and it's one that I, I feel, remembering my story is your story, Hala, uh, I have no idea how I've earned the right to have a voice like this. I come from a working class family, outback Australia, Greek immigrants. I got a good education in a great country. And then I got a great opportunity through Dow to absolutely look at the world as we developed it in these last three decades. And the big question in front of you is the one I opened with as a board member. You, you, the trends are at tipping points. Um, you can't extrapolate off the past trend you actually have to jump into the future. So your board questions actually have to ask your management, okay? Not what's around one corner, but what's around the second corner, okay? You need actually, and this is where, I, I hate to characterize it this way, but my experience with women directors and women in general is your intuition skills are more finely tuned than the male of the species. Sorry to say, I don't mean to <laughs> demean males. Uh, I am just saying intuition and questions around, does this smell right? Does this feel right? Does this sound right? And I don't mean the noise. Noise is one, only one of your senses. Your instincts here as a board member have to play loom large. Remember, depending on the CEO and the management team, they are coming in to give you a report on what happened, not will happen. And everything we've been talking about is actually what will happen. So I uh, just one type of question to ask. What's our risk management strategy if China invades Taiwan? Okay. Now, was that a board question? It better be, because the rise of China is we're seeing in the next 10 years. How do we treat climate change as a corporation in terms of internal metrics, not external metrics? I put a price on carbon inside of every Dow decision based on the nature conservancy. Is your company doing that? So proactivity in your question asking is what's required of you today. That's, I, I leave it with that thought because I don't want to make the minute five minutes, but I do think that's the key next thing that a board needs to have. Not to put pressure on your CEO. Your CEO, if they're good CEOs, are already thinking about this, but that's the boardroom conversation of today. The presentations, the role of committees, all good governments compliance. But remember, most of the rule books that they're operating by were last centuries. Hmm. These questions are going to create the rule books of this century. I think, Andrew, this has been such a rich conversation. We could have gone on forever. If I allow myself to add two questions, I think I would ask, are we measuring what matters? Are we truly doing that? And do we have the people that see the problems around the yeah. table to help us solve the problems? Yes, yes, totally. I, well, the, I implied that when I, the criteria for having board members. I'll say it another way. Country club boards were gone 20 years ago. Engaged boards is what we all went to. That was intelligent people asking good questions. But I use, I'll use the word because it's pertinent as it relates to Exxon. An activist board is what we need today. Mm. An activist isn't a bad word. Mm. An activist is active in these tectonic shifts that are occurring that's the who part in my view that's a great take andrew i so appreciate you and i know i speak on behalf of the community making the time to speak to us i have always said if we can just get more women in leadership everywhere things will get a lot better i know a lot of women in this community see it as well as men 
But I also will say wholeheartedly, if we had more CEOs and board directors like yourself, um, we could be driving at the speed and scale that we need to meet these challenges. So huge gratitude. Thanks for being a B team leader. Thanks for joining us today. This has been an awakening conversation. I hope that will inspire great, bold and 10 times bolder leadership and action from those listening. And thank you, Hala, for your great questions and for your bold leadership. It's a pleasure to be your teammate. Always. Thanks, Andrew.